why don't you take a seat and tell me what appears to be the problem? Welcome to the 45th episode of Consult the Doctor. And in this episode, what I thought we would do, I requested some questions uh, online, and I thought it might also be fun to throw in some personal questions. Now, some people don't care about my answers to personal questions, and that is totally understandable. Um, so here's what I thought. Here's what I thought I would do. I will first answer four questions about pens, and then I will answer four personal questions. So if you only care about pen stuff fully understandable, then you can leave after that. You don't have to scroll through things. Are you not entertained? Okay. Question one. I've compressed this question a little bit, but what does heat setting in Ebonite feed mean? Have you maybe recorded a video on that? No, I have not. And it's a, that's a really good question because it's a very useful skill for a fountain pen user So uh, to have. So the, there are pens like this. This is a Cross Townsend. This has a plastic feed. There are also pens like this. This is Leonardo Pura, which has an ebonite feed. Okay. Uh, typically, it will be advertised whether your pen has an ebonite feed. If there is nothing in the description, usually it's a plastic feed. Is this relevant? Yes. I have sung the praises of ebonite feeds in the past. They have very good flow characteristics. And back in the day, vintage fountain pens, which were then not called vintage, then they were just called fountain pens, um, they had ebonite feeds. And they keep up with ink flow very well. Think of those old wet noodle 14k gold nibs that put down a super wet line and they just keep going going. That ebonite feeds. Then why doesn't everyone use ebonite feeds? That's not the question here. The question here is what does heat setting an ebonite feed mean? Well, ebonite has a memory effect which is very useful. There are situations thinkable where the fit between a nib and a feed are not perfect. If this is the feed and this is the nib, they have to be flush on top of each other. Okay, I would, I would like to do it like this, but that's a little difficult for me. Anyway, you would like them to be flush and the nib will stick out a little bit from the feed, like to the front, right? Of course, you know that. Because if I put on, ugh, if I put on my nifty little clipping device, you can see exactly what I mean. Here is my nifty little clipping device. Here is a feed. Here is a nib. The nib sticks out a little bit in front of the feed, but you can also see there is here no gap between the nib and the feed. Okay? I don't mean to make you nauseous, so we'll take that off now. But sometimes such a gap comes to be. Such a gap comes to be because the pen has been assembled poorly um, and then shipped out. Or the gap comes to be because the nib has been lifted off the feed a little bit, or the nib comes about, uh, sorry, the gap comes about because you took out the nib and feed to clean it, <clears throat> you put them back in, and <clears throat> things didn't exactly end up the way they should have been. In such cases, you will find that your pen no longer writes properly because this gap between nib and feed now hampers ink flowing down from the feed into the slit between the tines and be pulled onto the paper. That no longer really happens. And then you have a pen that writes poorly. In such a case, you could heat set a feed, but you can only heat set ebonite feeds. You can't really heat set plastic feeds. I know that some people do it, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's usually not very successful because plastic does not have the same sort of memory as ebonite. So what does it mean? The process is simple. You heat up the feed then the ebonite becomes a little soft, you push it against the nib so that everything is nice and tight, and then you cool everything down again. When you have cooled everything down again, the feed stays in place, and now it is heat set. It again fits snugly against the feed just like it did before, sorry, against the nib just like it did before. How do you do that? The traditional way is with fire. So you take a little alcohol burner, it's Spiritus Stelletje from the Fondue set uh, for my Dutch friends, uh, and the, the, the person who asked the question was Dutch. So, um, you know, a little alcohol burner, you, you have a little, little one of those little blue flames, you hold the feed over, not in the flame, 
Trust me, I found this out the hard way, but ebonite burns. So you don't put it in the flame, you put it over the flame so that the heat rises up, makes the ebonite softer and more pliable, and then you hold it in place carefully because it can now be hot, right? Um, and then afterwards you could, when you know that it's, it's, it kind of seems to be in place, you can dunk it in cold water. That's one way to do it. There are certain hazards involved. There is burning alcohol, there is open flame, there is feeds catching fire. I did actually once do this to an Omas feed, it actually caught fire. Uh, none of this is pleasant. I then saw a great suggestion by Kevin from Fountain Pen Revolution uh, that I thought was brilliant. He said, just take very hot water. Take really hot water just off the boil. Dunk the nib and feed in there. Be a little careful with the whole section if it's an ebonite pen because the ebonite of pens will discolor, okay? But for the feed, it's not really, it doesn't, doesn't really discolor because it's in contact with wet ink anyway. Put in that hot water, a couple of seconds, take it out, squeeze it so that everything is nice and tight together, put it in cold water, done. I've used that technique a number of times and I found it to work very well. You may not generate the heat that you might with an open flame, but you also don't run the risk of setting the house on fire, which to me means quite a lot. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Two, which pen that you have used has the finest piston? Well, that really depends on how we defend, sorry, Freud. That really depends on how we define finest piston. Um, I like those Delta ratchet pistons that have make that clicking sound and that in some in the mind of some that's actually a captive converter. I'm fine with that if you want to call it that, but I found that to be a very pleasant system. Um, the downside to those systems is that they're not very easy to, to disassemble and maintain. From that perspective, uh, I have found that the M800 and M1000 pistons are very nice because those can disassemble with a Twisby wrench, which is a pretty cheap thing to get. And that's kind of nice because you can just take it apart, lubricate it, etc. As to mechanism, I, I feel I should say the old telescopic Mont Blanc mechanisms were best uh, because they really kind of more or less fold in on, each, in, on themselves and they really maximize ink capacity, all that stuff. Um, I've talked about those in a previous installment of this series. But it really depends on what you mean by finest. I mean, the smoothest, everything can be smooth. It just needs a little bit of lubrication once in a while. Uh, so I, I don't know if we're talking about that or if we're talking about the actual technological features of that piston. My, my answer would depend on that. Okay. I didn't write anything. Uh, I didn't write any timestamps. Okay, I'll start now. When you have a cartridge uh, in your pen, why does the ink start to evaporate after about a week? Well, that's because the ink is water, dye, usually an anti-fungicide, sometimes antimicrobial stuff is in there to make sure nothing grows in the ink. And there is a binding agent which makes sure that the ink will actually bind to the paper because if you wouldn't have that and it would just be water and dye you could be in a situation where you write on a page the water dries up and the dye particles pretty much just get blown off the page so they also have to stick to the paper um, being water and water being stored in a plastic container I don't know about you, but I'm sure you have probably squeezed a cartridge once in your life. It's really weird. I bet you didn't think I would say that sentence. Anyway, if you go around squeezing uh, cartridges all day, uh, what you will find is that it's usually very soft plastic. There are some exceptions. Parker cartridges are a bit harder. Uh, I found that the... Um, platinum cartridges are a bit harder plastic, but I'm thinking of those little standard international cartridges, they're often a fairly soft plastic. Because that plastic is a little bit porous, I mean, how could it not be, right? There's always a little bit of, of porousness. I don't know if that's a word. Anyway, 
the, the plastic is a little porous, so water will slowly evaporate. And of course, the hotter it is where you are, the faster that will happen. Um, I still want to do this experiment in the Kalahari Desert, where I just sit there under a bit of a sunshade or something. But also leave a pen out and see how, like, if the cartridge, the section is out, the cartridge is in, see how long it takes. Because I bet it wouldn't take an awful lot of time. Anyway, uh, that's why. Porous plastic and then just the liquid. Liquid evaporates. And then, of course, the fun thing is the dye that remains becomes more concentrated because there's less liquid, so the ink becomes a bit darker, which is another fun thing. And then you have to be careful that you don't end up with a clogged pen because at some point there's so much dye and so little water that the whole thing becomes clogged. There you have it. All right. Lamy 2000 or Pilot Vanishing Point. Well, those are two fairly different pens. Um, I will say that they're both maybe classic or iconic pens. But one is a piston filler with a hooded nib and the other is a cartridge converter filled pen with a retractable nib. Uh, I would be inclined to say that of these two, I would prefer a Lamy 2000 for the reason that I have never truly cared for the vanishing point, which is not a reflection on the pen, but I just think if you want something with a retractable nib, then maybe use a ballpoint. But having said that, I understand there are professions where one-handed operation of a pen is, is, is important and, and useful. I'm just not in that profession, so for me that doesn't really matter. I've never really felt that appealing. Anyway, now we move on to the personal questions. What pen would you use to get an autograph from George Lucas? I think that it would have to be a Star Wars pen, obviously. And although I have a Boba Fett pen and a Yoda pen and a Darth Vader pen, although I strongly sympathize with the Boba Fett pen. I think the greatest writer of the three is the Darth Vader pen. The, the cross did a very, very good job with the peerless model and the sailor nibs. And the Darth Vader is a pleasure to write with. So I would probably do that. And I also think it would be very funny. Like you have George Lucas, the creator of the whole Star Wars saga. And then you have Darth Vader, the chosen one, the one about whom it all revolved, etc. I think that would be a nice regress. Okay, here's a good question, another personal question. Um, what did you think of the book of Boba Fett? Well, trying not to give any spoilers, although I assume that at this point everyone has seen it, I thought it was interesting in many ways. I've always liked, as I just said, the character of Boba Fett. I think some things in that series were very appealing. And I think certain other things were less appealing. I personally enjoyed the flashback scenes because they answered many questions about the backstory of the character and how he ends up where he is. I also liked that there were nods to other parts of the Star Wars universe, other characters that show up that came from the animated series, etc., which I have not watched because I simply cannot bring myself to watch cartoons for extended periods of time. I, I, I just can't do it. It's something in me. I just don't have the patience for that. Um, but anyway, that was I think that was nice. I do think the story was dangerously thin in many ways, and I found the choice of a bounty hunter becoming a crime lord, a fairly odd one. But I think one of the issues is that if you were to do a series where you kind of go bounty hunting with Boba Fett, so to speak, and those are the different episodes, you are pretty much just doing the Mandalorian all over again. That the story was thin, I think, also is quite clear given that at some point Boba Fett just disappears for two episodes and it's only about the main character from The Mandalorian, which is a very odd choice in a series devoted to Boba Fett. 
Um, but having said all that, I enjoyed it. I also think that we must be careful not to treat Star Wars as if it is some sort of Shakespearean tragedy, because it's not. It's just entertainment. And you can take it for what it is. Some things will work for you, others will not. The world hated um, The Last Jedi. I love The Last Jedi. I thought the emotional depth given to Luke as the disappointed um, teacher was incredible. But that movie has its own issues. And I also understand that people had a very different expectation of the return of Luke Skywalker. So again, different things work for different people, just like with pens, and that's okay. But we tend to forget about that a lot in today's world. You, 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 you don't have to have an opinion about everything. This is Marcus Aurelius, so this is the tiny bit of stoicism coming out. It's okay to not have feelings about something. You don't always have to aggravate and sort of, etc. Okay. Um, the final question that I have here, um, I thought was an interesting one too, is what is the most important thing you've learned about yourself since starting this journey? I'm assuming that by this journey, we mean pen reviewing. I can say many things about the pen world, but I wasn't asked about that, so I will refrain from commenting, dot, dot, dot. About myself, I have learned a number of things. I have learned certain skills in doing this, and one of those skills is definitely how to handle feedback, which was difficult at first, which some days still is difficult, but which has become a lot easier. When I say feedback, I typically don't mean actual constructive feedback, but I mean pedantic, nagging feedback that goes on and on and on and on by people who've never uploaded a video on YouTube, so who probably should not be giving feedback. Think about what it means to give someone feedback if you've never actually done the thing that you're giving feedback on. Learning to deal with that is a process uh, that takes time. For me, it took time. And it's been interesting. It's been interesting to find a way to learn to deal with that so that I don't get upset and to the contrary that I can now kind of have have fun with it. Um, that I think is, is very important. Another thing I have learned is that there is simply no pleasing everyone. Because no matter what I say, it's wrong. It doesn't matter what I say in a review, it's always wrong to someone. Because I am not a, in favor of, of brand X, and therefore I'm wrong. Because that person is in favor of brand X. Or I'm absolutely wrong to not like fine nibs. Or I am absolutely wrong to not like converters, or piston fillers, or vacuumatic fillers, or cartridges or eyedroppers, or it doesn't matter. You'll always be wrong. And that's okay. But it takes a little bit of getting used to that no matter what you do, it's never good enough for a community. And that's just the way it is. So I have learned to accept that, that there is no pleasing the fountain pen community just like there is no pleasing any community, and to simply do what I think is best. And occasionally, I will remark on that in videos, and when I do that, then that is not good, and then that annoys people. So there's no winning, and that's okay, because it's not really about winning or losing. It's about learning to find a mode 
that works for you and learning to take feedback that you receive um, I don't want to say with a grain of salt but take it for what it is there is a sorry but another wonderful stoic uh, viewpoint on, on feedback which is you look at the person who gives the feedback if they are right you shouldn't be upset if they are wrong you shouldn't be upset you see the point here right and once I, I, I understood that like actually understood that 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 is indeed correct things become easier but that's something that you you learn so maybe I'm not I have not truly answered this question in ways of what I have learned about myself but the skills that I have tried to master and that I continue to try to master because this is a work in progress but that matters to me and I think the most important thing and this truly is advice that I think applies to all walks of life every possible thing you can do in life you have to do what you think is best of course with respect for others without endangering others without doing anything that will on purpose upset or hurt others but you do have to do what you think is best and when it comes to the reviews that I do I now do what I think is best back in the day I was very afraid and I, I will I will start to round this up but back in the day when I started I was afraid to say things that upset people and then I found out that people are upset anyway so then you may as well not hold back and for me not holding back does not mean being rude and does not mean being evil does not mean tearing something apart because nobody is served by that but being clear I don't like this this is too expensive or this is expensive and therefore people will not like it but I like it because I see the quality in this product and if it's not for you then it's not for you then purchase something else and that I think has been a very important thing so if I have to distill this into what has been the most important thing you've learned about yourself in doing all this then the most important thing I've learned about myself is that I must be myself and that I must be true to myself and in doing that everything else is mere commentary um, the rest will come and people will follow you or not and over the years I know I've lost some people as followers because of the things I've said or opinions that I've held about certain things and that's fine because if you are that offended by that thing I said then you probably shouldn't follow me because then I'll just end up aggravating you why, why would you want that and to be frank why would I want to have you as a follower I hope this makes sense I try to be frank here so there you have it I hope this was useful thank you very much for your kind questions this was consult the doctor episode 45 I already have started to collect questions pen questions for episodes 46 and beyond so please leave any more questions that you have please leave any comments suggestions feedback etc please don't now be afraid uh, leave, leave it below I appreciate it I hope this was useful and I gladly see you later bye